Well, hello, folks, and welcome to the Dieter Melhorn Fishing Podcast. I hope you're having a good day, whatever day it is that you happen to be listening to the show or watching it, perhaps, on YouTube. All of my uh, podcasts are now a video version on YouTube, so you can watch them or you can listen to them in the traditional podcast uh, format on all the platforms out there. I'm on every one of them, so Dieter Melhorn Fishing, uh, both on YouTube and um, the podcast version. All you folks that are regular listeners, I appreciate you coming back. Appreciate you, uh, appreciate you uh, tuning in and listening when I got these up. And all the new folks, welcome. I hope you like it. hope you enjoy it. And I welcome your feedback. Um, the hard part on podcast is to, uh, where do you send information to, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot easier on YouTube. I got a comment section and I can read the comments there. And a lot of times respond to them. Uh, so easiest thing to do is go to my website, DieterMelhornFishing.com. And uh, there's a contact section on there. You can email me. You can shoot me a text if you want to and uh, stay in touch that way. I love getting feedback from you guys. It's always good. Good there. And there's also a link to all my other stuff. Questions about fishing gear, everything I use is there on the website. Also a link to my guide service. Uh Licensed captain here in the Carolinas doing guide trips. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in some of that stuff, come fish with me. Check it out. It's all on the website and you can see what's going on. Um, today's show is about something I see a lot on Facebook. Uh, I've gotten a few questions about it, but I see it a lot on Facebook. Somebody catches a big fish and they're like, man, that's a great catfish. I want to get it mounted. Well, We've all been into museums and fish stores and Cabela's and you see these big stripers and stuff hanging up on the wall and you go, that's cool, man, that thing's mounted. I like that. I want to do that. And uh, the catch is with catfish, it's a little bit harder um, and uh, you can't do it, to be perfectly honest. Uh, the way the skin is on a catfish the whole process just does not work, does not work. And we'll get into that here in the podcast. But anyway, uh, it's always been hard to find a good reproduction, a replica. That's what you will see people make. Uh, the ones that uh, uh, my guys that uh, catch the fever, uh, makers of these beautiful Hellcat rods over here in orange, uh, they've got a big catfish. It's a uh, replica of the 140 one pounder that uh, Dale Lowe caught on one of their rods. And uh, it's a replica. It's not really the mounted fish. It's a, uh, a replica that is painted by an artist, taxidermist, and uh, they create these replicas. And that's what we're going to talk about today with a special guest, uh, somebody that knows way more about it than I do. Uh, at the uh, 2022 Catfish Conference, it's cool to say that, that we actually had one in person this year. Uh, I got to sit down with a lot of people and do a lot of podcasts and, and stuff out there. One of the cool ones that I uh, got to do was with Josh Roth of River's Edge Reproductions. He does replicas, reproductions of fish. Not just catfish, but any kind of fish. The thing that caught my attention with this catfish replicas was I've seen a lot of them. And... Uh, I've seen a lot of reproductions of a lot of fish and none of them really made me go, wow, that's amazing until I saw his. His work is phenomenal. It, 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 it's a work of art in the sense that the detail that's in it is just, is, it's amazing. On most of the replicas, including the one that the guys that catch the fever have, um, they look pretty good on the outside, a lot of them, until you get to the mouth. You know, that's where the real skin mounts on bass, uh, you know, stripers. I got a striper on the wall, a couple of them. Uh, that's where you get to see something. You actually get to see the inside of the mouth because it's part of the actual fish. You don't get that with a replica. You get to see the gill rakes and everything else that are in there. What Josh does with these things... I mean, it's amazing, and he puts them into settings. Uh, I just saw something recently. We don't have any. Uh, I didn't get, get to see it there, but he had a piece of cut bait that was hanging out of this fish's mouth, and he, he, this is like a, a, you get to see the guts and everything in it, the blood, the spine, the different 
come. I mean, it's just amazing the work he does. So we get to sit down with him in this podcast and talk about this and go into some detail on just what's involved, his history, his backstory, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I know some people are going to be interested in looking to get one of these done. And I'm just going to be honest with you. It's not cheap. Uh, this stuff is anywhere from 20 to $25 an inch. Uh, so if you're just looking to, uh, you know, throw a giant fish on the wall for the heck of doing it, just uh, be advised it's, it's not cheap. But with that said, nobody out there touches what he does um, that I've seen. I, I'm sure there's some out there somewhere, but his work is amazing. So uh, I'm going to put some links in the description section, both on the YouTube channel and also on the podcast and how you can get a hold of him if you're interested in seeing about getting something done. And uh, you'll be seeing more of him. Uh, he was, uh, it was funny when we, when he came in, he brought a couple of the replicas with him. And these were just basically, I call them head bounce, almost like a deer. It was just the head of them because obviously carrying a big giant one through there uh, would have been a pain. But he was nice enough to bring two of them. And it took him from the back door of the catfish conference to get to the front where I was at. It took about 30 or 35 minutes for him to get across the hall because every five steps, somebody was like, oh my God, did you do that? Do you do them? How much are they? Can I have a card? So he, he was re literally stopped the entire uh, trip across there. The work's amazing. Uh, I, I was just set back by it. But sit back, enjoy it. Let's talk with Josh Roth from River's Edge Reproductions. What's your fishing history? Have you fished and when did you start out? And if not, when did you first do it? Because you... I assume you had to touch a fish at some point in your life. No, I've been fishing since as long as I can remember. I can remember being out at our hunting property. Dad would be cutting firewood, doing whatever, and I'd be over at the farm pond catching bluegill, bass. I got his old Zebco 33 in the bottom of that farm pond because I caught a five pound bass and was so excited. I left my other Zebco with a hot dog on bottom and took the bass to show dad, came back and the center block was laid over and the reel was gone. Haven't seen it to this day. And that was like 95, 96, something like that. So been in a long time. Um, just got into catfishing probably the last five, six years. I used to be one of those uh, hot dog, chicken liver kind of guys. Could only catch channel cats at night. Never seen a blue or flathead in my whole life until I started getting on some of these catfishing pages online and watching a lot of dealers videos. And I still find myself watching dealers videos because I'm going to the lake two weeks from now when I was watching some of his wintertime Drifting techniques, um, do a lot of blue cat fishing now. I'd say probably 90% of what I target is blue cats. Uh, the other 10% is targeting bait to catch blue cats. So that's kind of kind of where I'm at now. What's the fish like? Uh, what's the fishing like where you're at as far as blue cats? I know I talk to different people, different sure. parts of the country, and what's y'all's fishing like there? So where I live in St. Genevieve, I fish the Mississippi River, and I'll be honest, I struggle. I get skunked probably more than what I catch fish but that's because I only rod and reel only. In my area, we're in a stretch where there's a lot of guys that keep a lot of fish. And you know, it's, it's not against the law. You're, you're welcome to do whatever you want. And I don't, I don't fault them for that. It's just how it is. Um, so there's not as many big fish as you'll see up in like St. Louis where the guys release a lot of the trophy stuff. And that's why you see a lot of those trophy cat guides up in that area. But I don't catch a whole lot there, but we do go down to Lake of the Ozarks and fish there quite a bit. And you can go down there, it seems like, any time of the year and catch fish. There are millions of two to four pound blues in there. And I mean, I've, I've been out there, I've had to break ice to get my boat out before and we've been out there when it's been 15 degrees and they got pumps around the docks breaking the ice up and we've just been dropping shad straight down and you can catch 10, 12 pounders just right off the dock. Um, one of the fish that we'll probably show today is pretty close to a fish that my daughter caught just fishing off the bank down there last year. Um, we like to go down there middle of May whenever the shad are right on the bank spawning and it's a buffet. You can't keep poles in the water. I usually will run six or seven poles off of the bank down there and we've had triples, quads. There's times where it's taken me an hour and a half just to get all my rods in the water because I got poles slamming because as soon as those baits are hitting the bottom, you got a blue or a flathead scooping that thing up. My daughter caught a 22 pound 
My nine-year-old daughter caught a 22-pound flathead uh, on rod and reel, which I'm going to do a repro on, or have it in process. I just haven't painted it yet. Too much customer work. Um, and then the same day, my wife caught a 21, and here I was the only one that didn't break 20 pounds that day. The biggest I caught was an 18-pound blue. So, but it was awesome to see them catch fish, and I bet we caught probably 10, 12 flatheads on cut shad that day. I mean, it was just so much fun. So we make it a point, second, third week of May, we go down to the lake every year because it's been pretty consistent the last three or four years we've been now, going down there. Had you ever, before you got into the reproduction world, had you ever gotten a fish mounted, a traditional skin mount? Had you ever had one done? I've anything? never had a skin mount. My nature, I'm very anal and OCD with everything. I've, and to kind of give a background on how I got into repros, um, so I'm a big hockey fan and I've done some really high dollar goalie masks airbrush, like thousand plus dollar, just paint, not even including the price of helmets. Um, and I'm, so I've been doing that and I've got an auto body background and I, I still work in that industry. So about a year and a half ago, I had a buddy who goes, man, with how much you like to fish and how good you are at airbrushed, I'm surprised you don't do reproductions. And I was like, Andy, that never crossed the radar, but that is a fantastic idea. And I actually had two fish done by Jimmy Lawrence up in Iowa. He's a world-class, won a lot of awards. Um, and I sought him out whenever I caught a Kentucky spotted bass down at the lake a few years ago. And the fish turned out fantastic, the bass did. And I, I caught a piebald blue cat fishing down here in Kentucky by the dam one year. And I had Jimmy do it as well. And when I went and I picked it up, and don't get me wrong, Jimmy did a fantastic job on it. But I looked at it, I'm like, why am I not doing this myself? I feel like I could do this myself. So last summer, maybe the summer before last, yeah, summer before last, wife and I went down to St. George Island and I wanted to catch a shark. My goal was to catch a shark that, down there. And I was fishing for him just like I do catfish, big bloody cut baits, big gear. And second day we were there, I caught a Atlantic sharp nose about this big. I was like, sweet. Took a bunch of pictures of it and I had my tag. So I ended up flaying it and we ended up keeping it and ate it. And then uh, the last day we were there, I ended up catching another one. I caught a little black tip shark, about the same size. So I hit Jimmy up and I was like, hey, you ever done a shark, Jimmy? And he said, no, but I could. And I'm thinking, yeah, but you know what? Why don't I give this a shot? So we're literally driving home from Florida. I can remember driving, we were driving through Illinois and I'm on my phone just looking for shark blanks on, online. And I couldn't find anything that was that spe those particular species or those sizes. And I stumbled across an awful looking fiberglass shark on eBay that was within about two inches of the two sharks that I caught. So I ended up buying them. And I thought, well, it's no different than doing auto body work. You know, you're, you're gonna be cutting stuff, you're gonna be molding stuff. So I ended up, cause it had just this, every shark that I've seen has always had a really big open, over exaggerated jaw, big bubbly glass eyes, and they look terrible. So the first thing I did was I cut the jaw off of this fish and then beveled the teeth down to make them look a lot more realistic. And it had, they weren't glass eyes cause I could sand them, but it was some acrylic or something. So I sanded the eyes from being real big and bubbly to a lot more streamlined and ended up hand painting the outside of the eyes, which you don't do that normally, but I was going with what I had. And I ended up doing a, a double shark mount and I caught them on the, the beach at St. George Island. So I, I found a synthetic dock post, wrapped some old um, rope around it. And I got one shark going this way and the other shark going this way. And I found a rustic sign that says St. George Island beach on it on eBay. It was like 20 bucks. And I, I don't know how I found that, but it was like perfect. So that's how my first mount for myself came together. Well, let me say, first of all, I'm impressed that you know what an Atlantic shark nose is because generically that turns into sand shark yeah. uh, anywhere in the world. So I commend you for yeah. knowing that. Uh, that's pretty cool. But back up and explain, just for folks that are listening that don't know the difference, the difference between, uh, explain the terminology, a mount, a replica, a skin okay. mount, and what the difference is and when you can do one and when you can't do yeah. one. The sharp nose that was on the test. You had to take a test for a Florida shark license. Okay. Um, but uh, but yeah. So there's the traditional skin mounts that a lot of people see. You go to Bass Pro. You see the ones where the eyes are looking straight up at the ceiling. The fins are all cracked and busted up. That's a skin mount. Um, the reproductions that I do, they're they're made off of an actual fish. An actual fish has been sacrificed to make that. However, um, what I use are a plastic blank. And what they do is they will take an actual fish, they will put it into a bed of mache and use some type of plastering putty to pour over that to make a direct reproduction of the one side. They flip it over, 
clean the mache off the other side, spray down uh, a, a mold release, and then do the, the filler on the other side of it too, and encapsulates the fish. But what it does is it makes a mold of both sides. And there's, I'm skipping steps, but there's some other stuff that goes into there too. But then, long story short, you pop the mold apart, you take the old fish out, you clean the stuff out of there, and you got a mold to make an actual fish. That's what some of these, vent, these big chain suppliers will have. And then they will use composite materials to make use that mold to make a, a composite fish so even though one fish was sacrificed for that you know it, it allows thousands of reproductions to be made off of that size fish and i've got a handful of different suppliers that i use because customers might catch a fish and it might be kind of an oddball size so what i'll do is i'll, I'll look at all my different suppliers websites to see who has the closest ones a lot of times we can get within a couple ounces and a half inch of what their fish is unless it's just something really really off the wall like a 20 inch largemouth that's eight pounds or something like that in a situation like that if they kept the fish i can do the casting process because i recently had a customer her son caught his first fish and said it was crappie i thought oh cool it's gonna be like a 12 13 inch crappie you know she brings a, what looked like a sandwich bag with this crappie in it. I'm like, is that thing even legal here in Missouri? And I put a tape on it, it was nine and three quarters, something like that. And nine's usually legal, most waters in Missouri. But um, they had the actual fish. So I said, well, I can cast this. And I'll be honest, I'd never done it before, but there's videos on how to do it. So I bought the video on how to do it's it. a YouTube video yeah. for everything. Well, it wasn't a YouTube video. There, are, there was some YouTube videos, but they weren't as detailed as the video that I bought. But yeah, watch the video and I'll, I'll take the notes as I'm watching the video the first time through and then the second time through I'll actually hands on do it and cast cast the perfect mold off of his fish and it turned out really, really cool. So that's another avenue of the process or something. Now else is there a do. difference in the molds for a skin mount and for a replica? Or yes, you, okay. and that's why when, some, when I shoot a price to somebody, people will bark about price. Because I, I charge $25 per inch for what I do and in my area, there are some people that do skin skin re or skin or mounts and charge 15 to $20 an inch. And they're like, well, why is yours so much more? It's like, well, such and such is doing a skin mount is starting with a $20, $30 rough cut piece of foam that he might shave a little bit off of. And he pulls that skin over and he treats that skin, he treats that head and gets all that. So he's $20 piece of foam and some chemicals. And I'm, there's some other shop supplies that goes into that, but he's, he's hundred bucks maybe in, into that materials. I, I don't know, I'm throwing that out there as a speculative number because I've never done the process, but that gives you a rough idea. Whereas a 20 inch largemouth, for example, just the plastic fish alone is 200 bucks. And then you're talking another eight to $12 for a set of eyes. And then you're talking, you know, another 30, $40 for a piece of driftwood, or if I get synthetic or real, or we upgrade it, and then shipping. We won't even get into shipping in the taxidermy world, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. So long story short, there's a lot more overhead that goes into doing what I do as opposed to the skin mounts. As far as the paint process, once the fish is actually, and what a lot of people don't realize with the skin mounts is when they start to chemically treat them and whatnot, it leaches all the color out. You might, like on a bass, you might see the lateral line stripe still on there, but you lose a lot of your, your pearls and your colors and stuff. So those guys are still having to go back in there and airbrush them. And, well, some of them will go back in there and airbrush them and hand paint them. It all just depends on your level of skill of the guy doing it. Yeah. So there's paint work that goes into both sides of it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. The, uh, what are the limitations? I mean, obviously people always ask me, because I fish for catfish, mm -hmm. the subject always comes up about mounting a catfish, doing a skin mount. Why can't you skin mount some fish? What what keeps you from doing that? Soft skin, um, like on the catfish, you know, you've got no scales or anything to hold it together. I, I don't know exactly why guys don't skin mount catfish, but I've heard from other taxidermists. So whenever we caught that piebald, the guy that was with me, he wanted to take the actual fish, to, and he had called somebody, he wanted to take the actual fish to get it done. He goes, we, we can't skin mount catfish and for XYZ reasons. I'm not sure what exactly those reasons were, um, but it probably has a lot to do with there's no scales and the skin may just not keep. Yeah, I've heard that like it's that. the, for lack of a better term, tanning process, the sure. curing yeah. process in yeah. the skin causes it to constrict and yeah. draw up and it just yeah. doesn't work out. And that makes either. sense, yeah. yeah. So from what I've seen on replicas, I, it's like when I talk to you on the phone, I've seen some that are like, man, that looks awesome. And then I've seen some like, 
oh my God, what happened? And it seems to be the difference in all of it is the artist. And that's really what it comes down to is the amount of art. And it seems like you've got a real, for lack of a better term, artist kind of intensity to what you go into these things with because on the video podcast, you'll be able to see some of these things. Uh, I'll have some videos later that'll show what these things look like. But the attention to detail in yours, that's what stood out. And that's why I wanted to talk to you. The attention to detail is pretty amazing. Is that part of your OCD that yeah. drives you? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, it, and it kind of goes back to whenever I caught that Kentucky spot. You know, I've seen good, really good taxidermy. And I've seen really bad stuff. And if I'm going to spend a couple hundred, well, that, that fish at the time was only a couple hundred dollars. But if I'm going to spend that kind of money on something, I don't want to have buyer's remorse two, three years down or six months down the road and think, man, I wish I would have gone with such and such instead of this guy. Cause man, that thing looks like crap. And now I got to live with it. Um, so yeah. And when it came to my work and doing what I want to do, I'm putting my name on that. Like I'm putting my name on everything that I do. I sign every piece of work that I do and I put a sticker with my company info on the back of it. So if somebody gets it and their friend sees it, Oh, where'd you get that done? They can see that. So putting my name and my reputation out there, I want it to look like it's something I hang on the wall. Like I, before we came down here, I just finished a double perch mount for a repeat customer up close to the Wisconsin, uh, Illinois border. And I looked at this thing and I thought, man, I need to go ice fishing now because I want to catch something cool so I can put one of these on my wall because this thing looks so sweet. But, but yeah, I just, I take a lot of pride in the work and I put that intention to detail into everything I do because I want it to look like you yeah. just pulled it out of the water. And, and that's the thing. I've seen some <clears throat> good catfish done, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and I pay attention to catfish. I've got some skin mount stripers on the wall that, mm -hmm. you know, look really great. The difference is always on catfish is the mouth. Yeah. The, it, most every mouth is just as open the gate thing with a just white smooth, or gray nothing. kind of yeah. nothing in there. Yeah. And you look in yours and it looks like a real catfish mouth. Is that actually a jaw pulled out of them or how does that process work? So it kind of depends on the supplier. Um, and I'll be honest, as I walked in and my wife can attest to this, I'd be like, that one looks like crap. That one looks like crap. That one looks like crap. And it kind of depends on the vendor where they get the blank from. And I kind of talked to Steve out there about this too, because some of those bigger, you start seeing these 80, 90, 100 plus pound blanks. There's some suppliers out there that have them and they're fiberglass. And a lot of those, they don't have the detailed mouth. It's just like a smooth, smooth bowl in there and they just leave it gray. I haven't done one of those particular, used one of those particular blanks yet, but the the ones that i've used so on my business card i got a 76 pound blue that I, I did for a customer and that fish came with a fully detailed throat that model did and the head was off of it so rather than install the head and then just stick the airbrush in the throat into the mouth of the fish and blow paint wherever paint blows um, i i had the head cap off i was able to detail in between all the gills on the gill basket detailed the crush pads and i think you actually commented on my facebook page when i posted some pictures of that but i mean you look into the throat of that fish and it looks like you're looking into the gullet of an actual blue cat on there and then like these shoulder mounts that i've got um, when i do these shoulder mounts i just buy a head cap fins, whiskers, and eyes, and the rest of it I make out of foam and clay. So on those, I spend a lot of time hand making that gill basket, but in my area, I think I touched on earlier, I got a lot of guys that keep big fish. So I'm gonna talk to some of those guys this summer whenever they start going out and catching fish and keep the heads for me because what I wanna do is take those heads and make a mold off of the throats of those fish because I can use some products to make a mold off of the throat and then use a latex to go over that mold and pull that off of there and turn it inside out and have a throat that I can just drop straight in to one of these shoulder mounts and not have to hand do all that. So it's gonna expedite my process a lot more on there. Wow. Now, <clears throat> like everything in the catfish world, Catfish fishermen are notorious for seeing something and going, man, I, I like that anchor that, you know, never lost anchors out of here. I'm going to go home and do it myself. You know, I like those drift sinkers. I'm going to go home and make them myself. This don't sound like something you can really throw together at home. I've had a very artistic background and been blessed with some talents. And there's some things that I've ran into that have been very challenging for me. So if anybody wants to try, Good luck, have at it. And, I, and I, don't, I don't say that to be condescending or anything, but like some of it can be very, very challenging. Even with the background experience that I have, some of it can be very, very challenging. But kind of going back to the, like the throat 
process and that and some of these bigger blanks that you see out there that just have the bowl on them once I'm able to get some of those throat molds and make some of those throat molds and I, and I get a customer that wants 110 pound blue or whatever done, if I get one of those big fiberglass ones in and it's just got the bowl in there, I'm gonna dremel out that, make a hole, drop my throat in there. That way it'll be one of the only ones, and I shouldn't be saying this online because somebody might go beat me to it, but if they do, whatever. But that's, that's my game plan moving forward. I just have to do a couple things between here and there to wow, get that that's going. that's a lot. If people take the time to see the video version of this, you'll see the detail of these things. It is amazing what it takes. Do you base that on photographs? I mean, yeah. do you have like photographs that yep. you look at? So as an avid fisherman myself, I don't even go fishing without my iPad anymore. Um, of course, whenever the customer takes pictures of their fish, some people take great pictures, some people take awful pictures. So whenever I go out fishing, I take my iPad with me and I'm constantly taking reference photos and I've got thousands of reference photos in my own iPad of all different species, all kinds of variations of panfish, crappie, bass, catfish, multiple species of catfish. That way, when I get a customer, because I had this happen already, customer had a six or seven pound largemouth bass and the picture that they had was taken at night and it looked like in a barn and they were doing this with their phone while they took it. So I essentially used the photo, their photo to get the lateral line, lateral line stripe and the markings. And then I used my own reference pictures that I took of a bass that we caught catfishing <laughs> um, earlier that spring and went straight off of my photos because they were detailed for all the coloration and stuff. And, and it turned out awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing of having the mounts themselves, are you going to try to build a collection of them? Because it seems like having that would, especially on some of these odd sizes, I would guess, would greatly help. Is that something you can do or is that a big, is it just as easy to go get these things from the people who make them already? So there's a lot of manufacturers out there that have a wide variety of blanks available. And every once in a while, you'll get an odd size, like I mentioned, the 20 inch eight pound bass or something like that. If the customer has a fish, um, you know, I'd be happy to make a mold if it's something I can't get one for. It is a lot of work to make a mold on that. Like the, uh, the, the small crappie I did, that was not a money making job, but it was a fantastic learning experience. And if a customer ever catches a 60 pound flathead and they want it eating a small crappie, hey, boom, I got you already. But, um, I, I got a 17 and a half inch, three pound crappie in my freezer right now that a customer had, they were gonna do a skin mount. And then he saw last summer, a demo I did at a craft festival. And he goes, man, I didn't realize you did these. He lives right down the street from me, ironically. And uh, he goes, I'm gonna bring you my crappie. So he brought me his crappie. So 17 and a half inch crappie, three pound crappie, that's a pretty common one. I think I've quoted a handful of them that have been within a couple ounces and a half inch of that. So I'm gonna make a mold off of that one because I can keep that mold and I can reproduce that one. But on some of the bigger fish, if you get something unique, maybe I would start making more molds. But with where I'm at right now, I'm in my garage and my house. I don't have a detached shop. And I literally talked to my wife yesterday about buying an additional store, like eight by 12 storage shed for the backyard to put next to the one that's got the lawnmower in it. So I could just put racks up for blanks and driftwood pieces and stuff right now, just to get it out of her parking spot in the garage. <laughs> well, let me say two things. First, anybody that's listening to the podcast, if you hear screams and crying in the background, we're at the Catfish Conference. We got a fairly secluded room this year, but uh, there's still people next door that are making all kinds of noise and stuff. So that's what that is. It isn't the fans trying to get in here to get to the mount. Uh, the second thing is that building, go ahead and get a bigger one. Cause I'm gonna tell you right now, uh, you're still way young enough that I think you're gonna be doing a lot more of this stuff. Yeah. And yeah, I'd be looking at something bigger than a small lawnmower size yeah. building. Which brings me to my next question. Are you doing this full time? How much of this are you doing? What's the big picture down the road? Because guys that do this, there's not a ton of them. And there's not a ton of taxidermists, period. It's mostly an older crowd that is doing it. We talk about that back home just with, you know, in the deer mounts and stuff. There's some guys that are doing it, but it's mostly older guys that have so much work that are sitting there going, 
I'm, you know, they keep threatening to retire every year. What's yeah. kind of your vision? Have you run the numbers on this whole business? We're in research and development mode <laughs> right now. Like I said, I've, I've only been doing this. I mean, if you, when you see the work, you'll probably call me a liar because I said I'll tell you right now, I've only been doing it for right out a year. Yeah. Um, haven't even had my LLC for what, six months, something like that. Yeah. I am very, very green, but it's right now I'm cranking out two, maybe three mounts a month. Um, so it's obviously very part-time because I've got two young daughters. I'm trying to make in a full-time day job. So I'm trying to maintain a healthy work home life balance to, to work and home life balances. But, um, I don't know. It's one of these things where we'll kind of see how this conference goes. Cause I, I couldn't walk from with, from the front of this catfish conference to the back without getting stopped every 10 feet for somebody wanting to look at these shoulder mounts. But I don't know, it could be in the five or so year plan. Um, we are actually looking to, well, not be in our house that we're in right now for a whole lot longer, but one of the things that's going to be a deal breaker in the next house is going to be a large detached garage for this only. Um, so I would say maybe five to 10 years from now, it could potentially blossom and be full time. But right now I just don't have the backlog of work. And I've had asked, I've had people ask, cause they see the quality of fish. Well, do you do deer? Do you do this? Do you do that? I say, I have no desire to do mammals. There's three or four guys locally that are already doing deer heads or doing small mammals too. And I'll be honest, I'm a bit of a diva. I don't want to have to do the fleshing and deal with all that and have to buy more coolers to stuff all that crap into. Heck, I don't even like having to, to cast one sometimes just because it's more work. I just assume like to put them together and, and paint them, you know, if at all possible. But, you know, I'll do the other parts of Listen, it too. Listen, my suggestion is you stick to your strong suit yeah. and you're definitely onto something because the guys I know that do taxidermy, they outsource their fish. Yeah. They outsource replicas, the guys like you to do that kind of same thing with, heck, even doing turkey mounts, the guys I know that do turkeys, they send them out because they focus just on doing deer. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. And it's funny that you mentioned that too, because there's a guy um, locally, Nature's Gallery, Craig Schmelsley, who he does some of the best deer mounts that I've seen in our area. And he does a lot of small mammals and he does do some big game heads too. But he had, and he went to taxidermy school and had people, uh, so he's done a few fish, but he has people come in all the time, you know, do you do fish? And before he didn't have anywhere to send them, he was sending them to a guy that was probably an hour and 20 minutes away who, is threatening to retire every year and he quit taking on work and he'll only do work for a handful of customers. But then Craig found out about six, seven months ago that I'm starting to do what I'm doing. So I took some of my work out to him and he's like, how long have you been doing this? I said, four or five months. He goes, you gotta be kidding me. It's like, no, <laughs> he goes, all right, how much work do you want? Cause I can start, I can put you on my website, my Facebook page, you know, blah, 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 whatever. I was like, let's just dip our toes into the pool first. I don't want to go dive in head first into the deep end. I said, you know, I'm going to do a couple demo pieces. Maybe I'll put one in your shop or whatever. So um, I've, I've got a bass in his shop right now and I've got a couple pretty good jobs from him so far. And people hit me up all the time coming from him. So it's kind of one of those things where he does the mammals locally or he's one of the better guys that does mammals locally and he kicks me the fish. So it, it works great. And I, I plug him any chance that I can too, because he does yeah. really good work. So. Yeah. <clears throat> That's awesome. I think you're you're onto something good. So all right. So so Dieter's out there and he catches him his his, his eighty pound fish because I keep raising the bar on when I'm getting a replica made. It went to sixty and then seventy and now I'm like I got a seven on now. So I got my eighty pound fish, but I'm going to release it. I'm going to release it live. What do I need to do to get everything that you need to make a replica? Of? Length and weight are the big ones. Um, girth if you can get it. If you don't have a 50 plus pound scale, there's formulas out there to where if you take the length and you do get a good girth measurement, you can get in the ballpark. Those the measurements are the big one and photos are the big one. Um, and I tell customers, the more photos that you can get, the better. Cause like I said, sometimes you get the one picture at nighttime where the fish has been rolling around in the, the grass and the weeds and it's covered in crap. Um, obviously those aren't ideal, but the more pictures that you can take, the better. And what I tell customers too is if the fish has any distinguishing marks, like it's got a cut fin, missing a fin, some kind of bump or something on it, um, take pictures of that too, because I'll put that in the mount. And if you guys check out my Facebook or my Instagram, there was a 76 pound blue that I did for a customer up in the St. Louis area where he sent me some pictures and he goes, this thing has a big bump on the side. Can you put that on there? And I zoomed his picture and I said, it's got a big bump and I can do that. But I said, it's got a lamprey wound right behind it too. He goes, dude, it does. Can you do that too? And I was like, 
duh, like, yeah, hell yeah, I want to do that because that's going to make it look that much more authentic. And I had a, a customer who um, hit me up for a double trout mount, and I guess he caught a brown that was missing one of the pectoral fins on one side, and he said, can you do that? And I'm thinking, yeah, it's going to be easier. I don't have to paint a fin. I don't have to install a fin. I can just use some epoxy sculpt and just give it a little little nub on there. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's stuff like that. If it's got anything unique, distinguished on there, my, like the, uh, the flathead I'm doing for my daughter, it had a pitchfork whisker on one side, and we didn't even realize it whenever we caught it until I was actually using her pictures as a reference for another flathead that I was gonna do for a demo piece. And I was looking, I was like, holy cow, this thing's got a pitchfork whisker. So the company that made her blank, I was like, hey, can you guys send me another whisker kit? So I was able to actually build this pitchfork whisker on hers too. So stuff like that, anything unique, take pictures of it. We'll get it on there. That's very, very cool. I, it's, it's, I just think, it, I think it's awesome what you're doing and you're jumping into this. and. And making a run of it. I can say I know you win. Um, what fish are you limited to as far as somebody's going to see this and they're going to go, well, I got a nine foot sturgeon or something crazy. What have you done? What are you comfortable doing? What do you want to stay away from? As far as right now, limitations are kind of um, what blanks are out there available. I've quoted people 10, 12 foot marlin. People see a 10, 12 foot marlin at $25 an inch and they start crawdadding pretty quick. Um, there have been some fish that, you know, I, I get outside my comfort zone, it seems like every once in a while, I these yellow, this double yellow perch mount that I just did. I've never done a yellow perch mount. Um, there, I, I couldn't find any videos because a lot of these taxidermy suppliers will have videos that will walk you through the color schedule and, and a paint process and whatnot. And what I do is I just kind of look at it and I see, okay, what colors can I use, whether they're opaques, translucent candy colors, pearls, iridescence, to achieve like that, what I'm seeing on this fish, how can I achieve that and layer it? And that's where the artistic part of it kind of comes in and um, hasn't restricted me so far. I had, you know, the yellow perch I had never done before. I just did a, a big small mouth. I posted some pictures on recently. I had never done a small mouth there. I, w I didn't watch a video for it. Um, and they turned out awesome. Um, I got a three foot barracuda in my garage right now that I shot with my spear gun scuba diving in Pensacola last fall that I'm gonna do. I got a four foot black tip shark I caught on the beach two days later that I'm gonna do. Uh, I got a 41 inch redfish a guy shot with a bow that I'm gonna do. So size wise, I mean, I've been doing a lot of three, four foot fish. I did a 49 inch blue cat. Um, size hasn't been a huge thing. I've got a buddy that has an auto body shop at the other end of my subdivision where if I did get that 10, 12 foot marlin, <laughs> I'd say, well, we're gonna have to figure out how to, how to rig this thing, but you know, it's something I could do. I, Is that there, bigger canvas easier to work on as far as, it seemed, I mean, it almost seems like something really small. You've got a lot more detail crammed into a little bitty area and the air room for errors is in is there. Yeah, so like on the, the nine and a half, nine and three quarter inch, whatever it was, little crappie that I did, first crappie for that customer, um, that was very tight, especially when I came in and was doing all the pearl tipping on the scales. You, you just had to just barely touch the scales on there, whereas I've done some 18, 19 inch crappie you got a lot more room to work, a lot bigger scales and stuff like that. Cause that's one of the things too. And the scale tipping, in my opinion, is kind of what separates the stuff that you see at Bass Pro that's kind of meh to the stuff, you know, that Jimmy or some of the other high-end guys, I don't want to say myself as high-end yet because I haven't gotten any awards or even gone any competitions, but like the guys that are putting in the more realistic stuff, they're doing the detail, the scale tipping and stuff. That scale stuff. tipping, is that done with a brush? Or, yeah. Okay, that's not yeah. airbrush. That's Bolt, the, well, it depends. It, it all just depends. Well, it depends on, yeah, that and the type of fish, the, the individual markings on that fish, and it all just depends. Like on like with the crappie, I'll do some airbrush work for some of the black markings, and then some of them, if they've got sharper lines, I've got some detail brushes where I'll, you know, come in with some black on there, or it's usually a black green. Black is too aggressive, but um, but then yeah, I'm using. My wife makes fun of me because I've got my own makeup sets, but I use makeup brushes and use some of the makeup powders to do the flesh tones, and then also use some powder pearls to do like the scale tipping on the crappie and some other fish and stuff. Wow, yeah. the amount of thought that goes into finding all these little things to create that visual yeah. is. 
I mean, that's just a, it's so much more than just getting an airbrush and yeah. The thing. Oh, I never would have thought I, and honestly, I, I have to attribute some of that back to watching Jimmy on one of the taxidermy you videos where he teaches how to paint a large mouth bass. You know, he does all his airbrush work first and then he comes into doing the powder work where he does some pearls and some makeup, you know, flesh tones. And it just blew my mind because I never would have thought of that, but it makes perfect sense because you use makeup on your face to achieve different flesh tones. Why wouldn't you do that on a fish? And I use it a lot around, you know, the gill plates, around the lips and along the bases of the fins and stuff like that. And it's just mind blowing how much easier and more real it looks than trying to mix airbrush colors that are out there to get a fleshier tone. Right, so kind of into the, the road here, you got one of these things, you got it on the wall. Um, how do you take care of it? Because, you know, I know with mine, they get dust on them and stuff starts to settle. How do you take care of one of these things so it lasts? So what I, what I use, I use water base um, Createx colors for my base colors. And then I use a two-part automotive urethane clear coat over the top of it. That's what gives it that fresh, just out of water look. The nice thing about that is if it gets dusty, you can just get a damp cloth and you can just wipe over it and it looks just like it did the day after. Um, some of the more intricate mounts that have like the snow scenes and stuff like that, you gotta be, you, you obviously can't wipe a wet towel over, you just have to kind of air dust them, something like that. But as far as like the fish itself, because I use that urethane automotive clear, just a damp towel and you can wipe the dust right off and they look brand new Is on there. Is it best to keep them out of the direct sunlight? Yeah. That automotive clear does help quite a bit too, because um, I mean it's it's made to be outside, and, you know, under UV rays all the time. So it's going to be a lot better than some of the other the skin mounts and stuff that you see. And I think it's best to keep them out of reach of a two-year-old. Yeah, and even the five minutes that we had these fish, these two fish here out there on a board, the lady at the booth said, "Oh, they'll be okay. I'll watch them." You know, people were sitting there pecking at them, touching them. I told my wife, I said, "As soon as we get done with Dita, we're taking them back out to the car because." I don't need broken whiskers to have to fix. I want to be able to just take these back home and <laughs> yeah. get rid of them. one thing with yeah. the catfish that's somewhat unique are the barbels, whiskers yeah. that come off of these things. Most fish don't have anything that long. They'll have little bitty ones, some of the redfish stuff. Yeah. But yeah, that's kind of, that's what's really cool about yours too. They don't look like, I'm trying to think of the nicest way to put it, a toothpick with some stuff wrapped around it. There's an amazing amount of detail just in, in those things. I have a redo where a guy, I won't mention where he got it from, but he had a blue catfish done somewhat locally to where I'm at. And whoever did it used synthetic grass blades for the whiskers because they're way too flimsy. And whenever they're that flimsy, if you don't put a flex additive in your paints, it breaks. And these whiskers were, one, they weren't the right shape because they were like real, real pointed corners on them because they're supposed to be grass blades. But the paint was broken off and I mean, they're bright green coming off there. I mean, it just looked awful. And this guy paid more for what this cost him than what I charged for mine, which was eye-opening in itself. But uh, what I was doing originally was I would, cause like Dieter said, I've seen some of them that just look like big thick kebab skewers sticking off of the front of the fish. They don't look natural at all. So I would use different thicknesses of wire depending on the whisker location and shaping them, making the, the spine of them out of wire and then coming back with an epoxy based clay to, to give the whisker some more meat to it. But then whenever I was working this blank for my daughter's catfish, uh, the whiskers that that man, particular manufacturer had with that blank were incredible as far as realistic, being realistic quality and you could heat them and move them and manipulate them. And I talked to that manufacturer and I said, hey, you guys need to make a whisker kit, you know, sell this as a whisker kit. Cause some of these vendors, they'll sell heads, they'll sell fins. And you know, I hadn't heard from him in a while. And he hit me up about a month later and he said, yeah, we're gonna start doing that. If you think there's a demand, I said, I've got people that are wanting to mass, wanting me to mass produce these shoulder mounts already. So yeah, like if I'm gonna do that, like I'm gonna need you <laughs> to be making whiskers because time's money and I can take those plastic whiskers, drill a small hole in them and put a wire, glue them on, boom, they're done. As opposed to spending maybe two hours trying to hand make them, so. Yeah. Well, in closing, this may be good, this may be bad, but how do people get a hold of you? I've got a Facebook page. Uh, I do have an Instagram. I don't get on Instagram near as much because I have too much other crap going on to even deal with Facebook so much. But um, my phone number is 573-883-6142. 
you can shoot me a text. You can shoot me a message on, on Facebook on there. Get a hold of me. I'm going to be probably getting blown up this weekend at Catfish Conference because I've been throwing out business cards left and right. But I will get back to you. And what's the Facebook there. page name? Uh, River's Edge Reproductions. Okay. It's all it's all ran together. Oh, and I'll put a link yeah. down in yep. the description so yep. people can click yep. on it and check it out. And yep. stuff, so. All right, folks, there you go. Let me tell you what I really liked about the podcast with him is uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, you get in front of a camera, a microphone, all this stuff, it can be kind of intimidating, and you have to pry answers and stuff out of people. The thing with him, man, he is so eat up with what he does. I love it. Uh, he is consumed by it, and uh, it was great because I didn't have to say too much. He got to do all the talking, or most of it, in this podcast, and I love that, and uh, I love his enthusiasm. Um, I love the fact of how much he is able to incorporate art, true true art, into what he is doing with these reproductions, and his talent is amazing, so, uh, so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you learned something about the whole process, and Maybe uh, if you're interested in getting one done, whether it be a catfish, a bass, a shark, he can do sharks, uh, hit him up. He'll be the guy. The contact information is down in the uh, description uh, of the podcast and the video. And as always, if you guys lose it, can't figure it out, hit me up. I'll put you in contact with him. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you out on the water. Well, folks, if you made it this far, thank you for watching. Here are a couple more videos that I think you're going to like. I'd watch that one and then that one. No, no do, do that one first and then that one. I, I don't know. Just watch them both. They're both good.